What can a silver-plated spoon and a tin toy badge tell us about advertising, radio, and early television? Stick with us to find out more on Artifactually Speaking. Hello and welcome to Artifactually Speaking. I'm Brad Hafford, archaeologist and specialist in the ancient world. And I'm Todd Pedrick, historian of modern Europe. Well, Tom, we're back to look at artifacts once again. We're calling these artifacts, and I am an archaeologist, so I'm used to artifacts. But the ones I normally work with are thousands of years old. And the ones in this series, they're quite modern. And many people have asked me, why, why do I do that? I think that archaeologists and historians, essentially, they do the same thing, but in different ways. And so talking more cross-discipline is important. I absolutely agree. And I've, I've certainly learned from being exposed a bit to archaeology. I can understand how archaeologists use scientific tools to regather the material culture of the past and see how we can learn from that and it, it gives me a, a different perspective because I'm used to using written sources on paper. Right. That's the big thing, that archaeologists tend to use objects as their primary source. Historians tend to use texts as their primary source. It doesn't mean we ignore the others. I mean, archaeologists right. certainly right. look at texts or they talk to text specialists and vice versa. So we're just trying to bring out a few things. And we do that by asking questions of objects. And I think we can use uh, that modified journalistic approach of the what, when, where, why, how, and who. There are many answers to these questions. They're rarely straightforward. Sometimes the answers could be a little odd, even amusing. Sometimes it goes to the darker side. It, exactly. And we are well, trying to be objective, learn from these things. And sometimes you're right. We uncover things that seem very unusual. You know, why would they have done this in the past? How could they have thought that was okay? But... We learn from that. Well, today's objects themselves do relate to, I don't know if you would call it, well, it's certainly not a bad thing, but a thing that can be taken too far, and that's advertising. I think that advertising can be very pushy sometimes because its goal is to make people buy things, in fact, even if they don't really need it. It can definitely be overbearing. And I remember, for example, when I was a kid, First of all, reading the backs of cereal boxes, they were very colorful and distracting, and there was all sorts of puzzles and details on them. But within the box itself, there would be a prize. Um, you don't really see that anymore. And it would usually be a flimsy thing, a piece of plastic. Or, but there was something about discovering that in there. It, it was like a hidden treasure. Yeah, I think that probably was the appeal, and it, it happened in things like Cracker Jacks and, and cereal boxes. And this was an advertising gimmick, I think, to get uh, kids interested in particular. And maybe kids today just don't need that. We're too digital, I think. You can't right. really put a digital app in a box of cereal. I think it would be underwhelming to uh, kids today. Well, not only did they put objects in boxes, but there were also things that you could send away for. So some companies would use as an advertising technique saying that, oh, just for a box top and some postage, you can get this free thing. And I think that was targeting more adults because they were the ones who would actually put money into an envelope and send it off. And today we're going to start with that. And this is, I think, a, a somewhat earlier technique before the boxes of cereal that were appealing to children who were not primary consumers, but rather they were trying to market to adults. And so, I think that is going to take us into our first artifact. This is a spoon. And you know, when I first saw this spoon, I thought, oh, surely it is marketing for children. It's got a silly looking character on the top. And I had heard of Charlie McCarthy as a ventriloquist dummy. But as I did more research, I found that, in fact, much of his humor was for adults. And... This spoon was, it was issued in 1939 as a premium, a send-away sort of thing. And it was connected to a radio program. 
Now, radio was a big form of entertainment, of course. And what the advertising here is trying to do is connect a character to the radio program and then the consumers to the character. And I suppose that you would stir your coffee with this because the radio program was called the Chase Sanborn Hour. And Chase Sanborn was a company that made coffee. So coffee was an adult drink, really. I mean, kids wouldn't drink coffee. And Charlie McCarthy's humor, even though technically he was supposed to be a boy, he was like Pinocchio, I suppose, a wooden boy. And he was the mouthpiece for the humor of Edgar Bergen, who was the ventriloquist who would tell these jokes through Charlie. Well, it's a it's a bit odd to me, and I, ha I have to ask, why would you put a ventriloquist show on the radio? Isn't that more of a visual medium? Yeah, it is, and I th it does seem very curious. Um, I suppose partly because television wasn't around yet, and in fact, Ed Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy had appeared in some motion pictures. In fact, in 1938, he was awarded a special Oscar that was made of wood. And then when he gets onto radio, it's really popular, and you would wonder why. So some people had said Bergen was a lazy ventriloquist. You know, he didn't really care that people could see his mouth moving, because on radio it didn't matter. But he did make other appearances. So I guess it's hard to judge what is funny or what people will find humorous. Well, I had talked about the what and the when, of this, but where? Well, all over the U.S. You could write in from anywhere. Chase Sanborn itself started in Boston, but their main offices, after they became Standard Brands or were bought by Standard Brands in 1929, were in New York. So you wrote off to New York. And it was 10 cents for the postage and one box stop from the coffee, which sounds pretty cheap these days, but of course this was a long time ago. And another thing that I find very interesting is that um, Edgar Bergen's daughter was Candace Bergen, who, of course, is an actor that has been in many, many things. And she wrote a book about her life uh, and always claimed that her father, Edgar, treated Charlie better than he treated her. And Charlie, of course, was a wooden dummy. Uh, in his will, he left Charlie McCarthy $10,000, and he left Candace nothing. So it's a bit unusual. Anyway... Charlie McCarthy is best known for that top hat and tuxedo that he wears. Bergen put this on him for a special program he did at the Waldorf Astoria. And then it took off, so they really kept him in that costume yeah, most of the time. But he would sometimes play a detective and wear a kind of Sherlock Holmes outfit. And he would also sometimes be a cowboy. In fact, in later years, so 1940s, uh, he had a comic book, and that comic book, in one particular case, he is shown as a both a cowboy and a detective. Here he is in 1949 as Charlie McCarthy, cowboy detective. And just like on a, a ventriloquist on radio, I find it interesting that now we have a wooden dummy who becomes a character that moves without his ventriloquist in a comic book. And I guess the Wild West was becoming very popular in this time period. That's true. Westerns have long been uh, an integral, integral part of American culture, which, appropriately enough, brings us to our next artifact. Indeed. Here it is. So this is a toy badge from Post Serials. It depicts the character Hopalong Cassidy. It's from 1950, and as long as you purchase the cereal, you could get it all throughout the United States. Yeah, this... and uh, we'll show the back here. Clearly says Post Raisin Bran. And what I find particularly interesting about the spoon is nowhere on it does it say Chase Sanborn. So that makes me wonder about its advertising potential. By this thing in 1950, they're clearly putting, you know, in big letters, the name of the company. And they didn't do that on that spoon. That's true. Maybe they thought Charlie McCarthy was a ubiquitous image already. And so tied to Chase Sanborn, everyone would know. Maybe, or maybe, maybe they were yeah. learning new techniques later on, you know, to get this more clear in the mind of the public. Well, here they're clearly building brand loyalty and attaching it to this specific character, right? We see the, the Cassidy is the William Boyd 
version. And Boyd started to portray Cassidy around 1935, and he would appear as him in some 66 films. Wow. Well, I thought I'd show the camera close-up of uh, William Boyd right here. Big, smiling cowboy. Very wearing... friendly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's wearing a black hat. Even though, you know, good guys wear white, he always wore a black hat. But he rode a white oh, but... horse, I believe. Oh, oh okay. Well, <laughs> as long as you get the white in there somewhere, right? I guess, for that that day and age. But and maybe he was around... progressive if he wore a black <laughs> hat, but I don't know. <laughs> and then, of course, you have this, the brand right there. Yep. It's also interesting that his face is surrounded by six pistols. That was the sign of a cowboy, I suppose. That's right. But a good cowboy. A uh, yes. lawman. He played that character so much in the movies, but westerns started to fade a little bit, I guess, as big draws in motion pictures by the end of the 1940s. And so he bought out all the rights to that character and decided it might work on TV. I believe it came to NBC TV. Right, and in fact, they're the same company that broadcast the Chase Sanborn Hour on radio. Yes, uh, NBC was into early television as well as radio, so they were really on many different platforms. 1950, 49, 50 is pretty early as television goes. Uh, I believe in 1950, only about 9% of U.S. households had a television. By the end of that decade, it was up to around 90%. Wow, so that's really an explosion. It is, and I wonder, why do you think the the West was so popular? Well, first of all, you have the idea inherent in American history of manifest destiny from sea to shining sea. But in popular culture like this, you really have the good guy winning over the bad. It's always a sheriff or some other guy who has to take down a posse of bandits, bad people. Boyd's hop along was a nice, clean-cut guy. What's funny, though, is in the original stories, he was a rough, tough, kind of rustic guy. Clarence Mulford was an author who, he wrote a, a series of novels and short stories beginning in 1904, or Cassidy appeared, and he's, he's, he's rough. He talks rough, he lives a bit rough, too. And uh, I'd like to read for you an example of the speech patterns in one of his, his novels. Um, and I think it's kind of funny. Uh, in one story, Cassidy says, sit down, all of you. We can wrestle this out without no gunplay. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I when we were doing we read some of these original stories, and I, I can't say that I, I'm uh, thrilled by them, but part of the problem was there was so much dialect. You know, he tried to make them all sound rough and tumble so much that it was hard to read. In fact, another example I found in those books is uh, cover the windows and fill that shack plumb full of lead. Pretty much every line is exactly like that. You know? And of course, lead here meaning bullets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I don't think that would have happened uh, in the William Boyd adaptations. No, I think he's still, you know, trying to round up rustlers and all of that, but in a much more grammatically correct way, I suppose. <laughs> And I wonder how much shooting there actually was. Another odd point to point out is that in the original stories, Cassidy has a wooden leg, causing him to literally hop around a bit. But I think in the Boyd character, he doesn't have a wooden leg, but they still had a story for his name Hopalog, didn't they? He had been injured. Yeah, I think he'd been shot, but not mortally, you know, he so he had a limp. He Right, right. Instead of a wooden leg, right. of course, Charlie McCarthy is completely made of wood, so right, there's right, a bit of, right. a, of a link here, I guess. They used to make a lot of jokes about that, about him being wooden. And there was a bit where W.C. Fields, I don't know if I can imitate him correctly, but I think he said, Tell me, Charles, is it true that your father was a gate leg table? <laughs> and Charlie said, uh, well, if it is, your father was under it. Now, but, um, yeah, exactly. This would make roars of laughter, and today it's like, what? <laughs> yes. What they're doing, I think, is making fun of each other's uh, backgrounds, which, well, I guess for a wooden right. character and someone, because Field's character, at least, was a drunk, basically. Right. Like Dean Martin. So, yeah, right. So he's saying, well, you're just a puppet, and your father was a piece of furniture. And then, you know, the puppet says, yes, but your father was drunk and so are you, basically is the joke. I, 
I don't know. We, <laughs> it's hard to analyze humor. At the time, I guess, yeah, they yeah. thought that was funny. And uh, in another interesting episode, 1937, on that radio program, Mae West appeared. And, of course, she had a character who was risque, right? And they knew this. That's why they booked her, I think. And they wrote a story for her or a bit that was Adam and Eve, but, you know, Eve gets a bit fed up and uh, she played it in her standard way. And it got her into a lot of trouble. In fact, it got her banned from NBC until about 1950, so about a decade where she couldn't appear. She had even said something like, Charlie, you can play in my wood pile." Again, doesn't make sense, but right, you can tell right, that right, it's supposed right. to be salacious, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> so, for, yeah, for something that doesn't entirely make sense, it seems especially harsh. Yeah, they when they banned her, it's mainly because they were trying to appease a group that had formed in the 1930s that was called the Legion of Decency. Uh, they were associated with the Catholic Church, and they were primarily concerned with immorality in films because, you know, motion pictures were... They'd been around for a while, but they were worried that it was going to negatively affect the morals of the public. So they campaigned against a lot of stuff, but they did include radio as well, and they objected, partly because this was a skit written about, well, a biblical story, Adam and Eve, and turned into something naughty, I suppose. Also, it was broadcast on a Sunday, and they thought, well, this is terrible. Not only are you making these uh, dirty jokes, but you're doing it on a holy day. And NBC really just threw Mae West under the bus. <laughs> they used her as a scapegoat and said, well, it, we wrote it perfectly innocently, and the way she said those lines was dirty. <laughs> well, of course, it's hurtful. <laughs> they, knew, they knew that she was going to say them this way. I yeah. can only sense that there's a, uh, a gender double standard at play. Oh, definitely. Well, that kind of gets us into the, the who of this spoon. I've said it's really adults. The program aired at about 8 p.m. or something like that. Kids would be in bed, the really young ones. And you had to send away for it. So I think that it was adults that would buy this. It's a silver-plated spoon and made by uh, Duchess, I think, Duchess Silver Plate. So the write-in premiums are are popular in this time. I think it makes you feel like you're getting a special deal. The ones that are packaged into cereals, though, I think those start to show up in a bit later era. And with your artifact, we're talking only 11 years later, but a lot of things have changed because television has come in. Absolutely. And the write-ins you mentioned continued even with cereal boxes, for example. Um, the package with the Hopalong badge also contained a silver-plated spoon. It did, and I think I've got an image of the package here. So right there in the center, which would have been on the edge of the box, because this is the unfolded wrapper, you can see a spoon made by Avalon yeah. in this case, but it's very similar to what we had. There's not really advertising on it, but there on the front, Hopalong Cassidy Western badge, and on the back it shows all the different badges that you could get. So keep buying Raisin Bran. And you can get all the, maybe you can get all the badges, or maybe you'll get 12 that are all the same one. Ooh, well, yeah, probably. But that's exactly it, to get that brand loyalty. You keep buying them to, to get the whole collection, I suppose. And, and kids like to collect things, even adults do too. It just depends on the sort of thing you're collecting. That image there on the front of the box, the Cassidy is kind of amusing. Mm -hmm. He looks older. Yeah, well, I mean, Boyd did play him for a long time, so I guess he turned into the sort of, Silver-haired, nice guy, still with his black hat and still, you know, being the good guy. Now, speaking of those badges, if you're going through the how, you would fold the tab down, put it on your shirt, and it would hang off like a badge. Uh, yeah, in order to wear it, right? But in this case, the uh, piece that would have been right up here at the top, you can see a little bit of breakage. They would have folded something down to fit oh, yeah. onto the pocket or something for a kid to wear it. But that has broken away on this particular example because it was folded down, and that's where the weak point is. So right. that would uh, break pretty easily, I'm afraid. It's made of just tin, I think, right? Pressed tin? Right, right. Yeah, it's not terribly strong. It's not like a real sheriff's badge. No. Of course. Uh, it's something that had to be mass-produced. Because they, they can't spend a lot of money to put one in every box and that's exactly why these things are so flimsy and yet it, it did work it really encouraged kids to uh, take these cereals I think 
but they also liked sugar, and these cereals had a lot of sugar in them. It actually all goes back to a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. The Kellogg brothers, J.H. and W.K., operated the sanitarium, and they were concerned about giving the patients there a vegetarian diet. Cornflakes was born. There had been a problem cooking wheat, and it actually, instead of coming out in strips, it came out brittle and broke into flakes. And it actually turned out to be really popular. Then the two brothers had a fight and a falling out over marketing this as a cereal. Right. I think J.H., John Harvey, I think it was, uh, wanted everything healthy, like you said, like a vegetarian environment and all that. But I think his brother, Will Keith, wanted to maybe add sugar to make it more appealing. Exactly. So they had this kind of falling out, right? And then, interestingly enough, there was, among their patients, somebody who became quite famous and wealthy, C.W. Post who loved this this diet they were serving there, and then also marketed it himself. And of course, we know Post cereals. And in fact, the Raisin Bran itself is Post. I think this is also maybe part of a darker side that we're revealing that injection of sugar in order to get kids to like it. It's almost an addictive. I mean, it's not quite the same as, say, nicotine. And we've looked at right. cigarette advertising before and wondered, you know, why for so long were they able to do this? Well, um, at the time, Post, when they first created Raisin Bran, I don't think they did it too long, but they advertise it as having sugar-coated raisins. So even the fruit had a coating of sugar on it. Interesting, though, it's not only kids. I mean, there's even today, there's a lot of advertising for this stuff to adults. We're starting to recognize that, well, too much is certainly not healthy. This is what leads to type 2 diabetes and, in kids, childhood obesity. There were actually some healthy cereals with prizes in them being advertised. Um, for example, you have Kellogg's Pep. It was, an, it was what was called a fortified cereal, a, a yeah. mildly laxative cereal. <laughs> Don't eat that before your morning commute. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a lesser known one because it's not made anymore, but it was competing with something like Wheaties, I think, which was also supposed to be healthier. From Kellogg's Pep, we actually have a pin. We do, and I'll switch to the camera, and you can tell us a little bit about it. Here it is. Pretty small. Yeah, colorful, though. Uh, mm. It's from a 1943 box, and it features the emblem of a naval air squadron. Yeah, see, how many people would recognize what that emblem is? A bat with, like, an S or something? Right. right here on the back, Kellogg's, Kellogg's Pep, Pep, of course. And on the very edge, it does tell us, Navy Cruiser Scout. Scouting Squadron 2. So that's the emblem of that squadron. And since it's 1943, I'm guessing this was aimed at patriotic adults during World War II. Uh, yeah, undoubtedly, though maybe uh, maybe not really young kids, but older kids might be also interested in following this because they uh, weren't old enough to go and actually fight, but they were maybe keeping track of it. Well, we're certainly looking at a bigger issue, and that's what I love about doing this. When we look at these uh, small artifacts that we're finding from recent history, we're learning something about a time that's not that far away, and yet also bringing up what we've learned. We have now banned cigarette advertising, I think, pretty much everywhere. Now we're looking at the dangers of sugars, and we're looking back at how they used to almost push it on us. That's kind of harsh of me to say, right, but it right. feels that way sometimes that they're trying to hook you and bring you in. But that's the job of advertising, I'm afraid. Well, that may be all the time we have. I hope you join us again on the next Artifactually Speaking. I'm Brad Hafford. And I'm Tom Petrick. Join us next time. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.